Many countries, including the United States, are in a fierce competition for leadership of the rapidly growing clean energy economy. Estimated to become a $2.2 trillion market, countries want to capture the economic growth and jobs expected from developing and producing low-carbon technologies to replace fossil fuels. But some countries are gaming the system to give their domestic firms an unfair advantage by adopting policies aimed at quickly boosting exports, protecting domestic industries, and limiting imports from foreign competitors. These countries are so-called green mercantilists, and they're using an old catalog of mercantilist and protectionist policies aimed at either artificially lowering prices to boost exports and limit imports, or to discriminate against foreign firms to give domestic industries an unfair advantage. But why should we care? As some clean energy advocates point out, if China or another country wants to subsidize clean energy, U.S. consumers benefit from cheaper clean technologies. Green mercantilism actually hurts U.S. producers. While subsidies and export dumping do benefit consumers in the short term with lower clean energy prices, it harms U.S. producers and the U.S. loses out on the economic benefits of the clean energy economy. But more importantly, green mercantilism limits clean energy innovation. Existing clean energy is not cost competitive or performance viable compared to fossil fuels. Simply put, first generation clean energy technologies are not going to be the technologies we widely deploy in the future. We need cheaper and better next generation clean energy technologies. But in other words, without next generation clean energy, the global community won't be able to address climate change. So while green mercantilism may help deploy a few percentage points of clean energy worldwide, it won't get us to 60, 70, 80, or 90 percent clean energy deployment in the coming decades. But we have to act now to ensure that green mercantilism doesn't limit innovation in the long term and potentially lock in inferior clean energy technologies today, which limits our ability to mitigate climate change in the future. There are four ways we can do this. The first is to support existing trade cases and aggressively prosecute cases in the future. The Department of Commerce's recent rulings and tariffs on Chinese mercantilist-backed solar, PV, and wind towers is a good first step, and we need to recognize how important those cases are and support them fully. But we need to also continue prosecuting cases within the WTO for all cases of green mercantilism. In order to do this, we need to boost support for trade enforcement. In order to prosecute more cases and act more preemptively, we need to boost trade enforcement such as increasing the budget of USTR so they can expand their capabilities and act more aggressively. But it isn't enough just for individual countries to take action. We need to start acting as a global community to ensure that innovation is the driving policy choice of countries in the clean economy. The third thing we need to do to eliminate green mercantilism and support clean energy innovation is for the global community to work to create clean technology free trade agreements. They could be very well mo modeled after the information technology agreements from the mid-1990s that gradually reduced tariffs on a laundry list of information and communication technologies and open up increasingly larger and larger markets that spurred more innovation and economic growth. For clean energy, the recent APEC agreement, where some member countries agreed to come up with a list of environmental and energy technologies with the goal of reducing tariffs on those technologies by less than 5% by 2015, is a good first step and could act as a starting framework for bolder negotiations in the future. And last, the global community must start incenting countries to pursue good clean energy innovation policies instead of green mercantilist policies. One way of doing so is for climate change negotiators to offer countries the choice to forego greenhouse gas emission caps and instead agree to meet gradually increasing government clean energy R&D investment targets. This would instantly boost investments in innovation at a critical time when we need more of it. But ultimately what it comes down to is policymakers have a choice. Do we want cheaper existing clean energy that is relying on government subsidies? Or do we want cheaper next generation clean energy technologies that are competitive on their own through innovation? Green mercantilism not only continues the former, but makes the latter much more difficult. How the U.S. and other countries address this issue may very well define the future of clean energy.